until you're coming from your 100%, you can't really give anybody else 100%. So if you're burned out and if you're exhausted and if you're like just going and going and all, you're probably operating at about 70% capacity. Hi, and welcome to the Visible Thread Optimized Podcast. I'm your host, Marsha Watson, CEO of Bullard Thomas Watson & Company. One of the things that I've always been passionate about in my career is that work-life balance, is understanding kind of how busy and, and difficult this industry can be at times, and helping people understand that some of those frustrations, they're temporary, we can get through them. So, so many of us have been thrown obstacles in life, in work, and in our day-to-day. They do throw us off. They do cause frustration and they make us feel as if we aren't in control. But people like our guest today, Lori McDowell, they understand that you can reinvent your perspective, that a lot of what we feel in our daily lives is in our minds and how we can revision, re-envision ourselves in what we do to improve our perspectives and therefore improve our way of life, improve how we work and improve how we coordinate and communicate with our colleagues, coworkers and friends. And we can do that by reinvention, by taking what we are and who we are and building upon that, finding the foundations of our positivity and our growth and, and understanding what that means for us in our jobs and how we can support each other. So we can turn obstacles into opportunities and tragedies into triumph. So this podcast is for anybody that's seeking to do the same. My guest today is Lori McDowell. She's an author, a speaker, and she's worked for years helping small businesses and other individuals kind of grow and change. Lori's passionate about helping individuals and businesses succeed. At Reimagine You Strategies, Lori provides training, speaking, and coaching to help individuals get past any roadblocks and find fulfillment in their careers and in their lives. She's the author of The Reinvention Mindset, released in April of 2024. And at previous positions, she's helped businesses reduce expenses and optimize their op- operations. She can be a one-stop shop to help businesses and people lead into self-improvement. Lori, I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you, Marsha. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah. So let me just explain to folks. Lori and I have a history together. We go way back. So this is going to be a fun, friendly conversation, but it's also... Um, Lori is a person I've come to rely on in, in my transition, in my own personal reinvention. And I feel that she has so much to offer um, in her perspectives for folks in this business development, federal contracting environment, that a lot of her techniques and strategies and thought process, processes can be adapted into what we feel on a daily basis and how we work inside of our organization. So like I said, I've known Lori a long time. She was my scuba diving instructor as I was graduating college, a lovely treat from my parents. Um, So, and I've always joked, if Lori could keep me alive underwater, she can certainly help me here on land. So Lori, I thank you, first of all, for keeping me alive underwater all those years ago. Uh, Haven't dove since mom and dad stopped paying for it, but (laughs) hopefully we can get back into it soon. Um, But in the time that we've known each other, and has stayed connected, luckily, through the social media and through LinkedIn. I've really admired and appreciated your perspectives. So if you don't mind, take a few minutes, Lori, and kind of walk us through your your life thoughts, how you kind of got here, um, and then we'll take it into a deeper conversation. Sure, Marsha. So um, to start at the very beginning, I guess, or I, I actually what, am a chemical engineer by degree, and I went to college, got a job, worked as a chemical engineer, went to grad school. I ended up getting my PhD and did all the things I was supposed to do. I got the job in the research and development lab and basically progressed through my career. And through that period of time, I had success. I, you know, I always did well. And then I'd always kind of like get, kind of get in a rut where it's like, yeah, I'm doing well, but this is kind of boring. Maybe it's time to do something else. So I would either move to a job, sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice, but I would move into something different. And I did that for about 35 years. 
always successful, but I never really, when I think back on it, you know, I was happy. I never hated any of my jobs. I loved what I did. But when I think back on it, I was never really 100% fulfilled. I never like jumped out of bed excited to go to work. I never felt that way. And I didn't know that you could feel that way, I guess. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a job at went where I was successful and I had a boss and I thought I would do that job till I retired. And then my boss retired first and a new person came in and it went from a job that I was very happy with to a job I hated. Um, the new boss was a micromanager. We didn't see eye to eye. And instead of just, I had been in this, you know, I'd been there 10 years. So I kind of pushed back. I still was a high performer. I had the highest, you know, the biggest customers. And one day um, I went, drove four hours to a two day meeting with my company when I checked into the hotel, they told me my room was canceled. I thought it was a surprise, reinstated my room. And when I met my boss that evening, he had HR on the phone and they fired me on the spot, told me I would be paid till the end of the day and sent me back home. So I was just, I was angry. I was terrified. I was shocked. I was like, how could you do this? And why did you do this? Why didn't you fire me this morning and save the four hour drive? And I realized they wanted to make an example of me. They wanted to embarrass me and show everyone that, look, Lori's our highest performer. Lori's been here a long time. If Lori can get fired, then you better all do what you're told or you can get fired too. So I started the drive home. And like I said, I, I don't even remember half of it. It was, I was angry. I, you know, I'm surprised I didn't drive someone off the road. <laughs> and then Suddenly, you know, about a couple hours into the drive, the thought popped into my head that I don't have to go to work tomorrow. And when I had that thought, it was like, ha, I don't have to go to work tomorrow. And I just felt, I felt amazing. I felt free. I felt lighter. And I decided right then and there that I had been, you know, never again was I going to put my happiness and my success and my joy and how I felt in someone else's hands that I could take charge of my life. And now that I had this experience, I could do what I wanted to. And I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time, but I figured I would do something. And I and it just, it completely changed my perspective and changed my mindset at that moment. And it changed the way I lived from there on forward. That's uh, so relatable. <laughs> And, and it's funny when, um, when I departed my prior position before starting this company, you know, Lori was one of the first people that, that reached out to me for how can I help? How can I get you through this? And that, that talk, Lori, of, I loved my job. I wanted to be there forever. I wanted to retire from there. That is totally true in my world as well. And I feel like that happens a lot in, in a lot of folks is that they do have that love, true love for their job and their role, especially in this industry. It's a very demanding industry. And in Proposal's perspective itself, um, Proposal managers are high performers. They're type A personality. They're very particular. They're perfectionists. They're the person. They're people pleasers. There's a lot of personality traits in the proposal profession, especially expanding out into business development, sales, government contracting overall. I mean, we're all driven by success. We're driven by the, the need to feel needed and the, the want of being successful. And also, I think a little bit of the responsibility and feeling accountable for way more things that are within our span of control for absolute truth. And that leads to burnout, exhaustion. I'm done with this. I don't care. And when we, when we in this position, in this profession, get to that point, we start losing work. We start, you know, being non-compliant in, in the submissions that we put into the federal government. We start wasting our company's money in, in how we're performing. But it's, it's sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And sometimes it's the reaction to the world around you and working in these very busy, high demand, high growth organizations. So, and I know you're kind of that same type person. You're that type A person. I know ya. Um, you're always ready to succeed, but you're also the person that will sit there and gently put your hands on somebody's shoulders and say, you can do this. 
I have faith in you. And that's what I want to bring out of people as part of our conversation today, Lori, is to get them putting their hands on their own shoulder. I can do this. I have faith in me. So let's talk about that a little bit. What do you find as being in that personality type that kind of led you into this reinvention mindset that you talk about? Right. Yeah. I guess the first thing about that personality type is we 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 like to succeed. We like to get p- other people's approval. We want to know that we're doing our best. And what that tends to do is we end up doing what we're supposed to do. We do what we're supposed to do. And sometimes we don't really even think about ourselves in that. We just do what we're supposed to do. And, and we do what the company needs. We do what the job needs. We do what our family needs. We do so much because we want to perform and we want people to be happy and we want to be seen as a high performer. And in doing that, you can be happy and seen as a high performer, but you can only get to a certain point because you're doing it all from an external perspective. You're doing what's coming from you on the outside. And what I learned in interviewing people when I wrote my book and in getting my coaching training and in studying things like positive intelligence and, um, you know, just inner, your inner harmony, your mindset is to really, really succeed. It has to come from the inside. Like one of my coaches says, you know, what other people think about you is none of your business. It really isn't. That's their issue, what they think about you. What you think about yourself and what you feel about yourself is really the most important thing. And I like, you know, we, we can't ha- we can't control what happens. So much of what happens to us comes from the outside and we have no control over that. The one thing we have 100% control over is what we do with it and how it affects it and how we use it. And, and what I learned is we always have a choice. Now we have to live with the consequences of that choice. We could choose, I'm not gonna work anymore and I'm just gonna go to the beach we have that choice. Now, the consequences might be we don't pay our bills, but it's a choice. And just like in, in your job or in your business, you have a choice in what you're going to do and how you're going to handle something. And, and that choice is it's really freedom because in that choice, you can look at what is really important to you and where what is your why? Why do you want to do this? Why is it important to you? to succeed? Why are you looking for this promotion? And when you figure out what your whys are, the hows and the whats just become a lot more clear. And they become easier to get there because you stop caring about all the external stuff. And you're, and because when you're doing that, you can actually get to a much higher level than when you're performing for the external purpose. So by doing that and getting in that mindset and, and accessing the other half of our brain, um, we can talk about this a little bit more, but most people, most high performers, most type A personalities, we completely live in the logical side of our brain. We don't really, you know, our unconscious, we leave our unconscious alone. We let it breathe for us and, and <laughs> for a heartbeat, but we don't live Sometimes. in that creative, <laughs> that other side of our brain at all. And by doing that, we're really limiting ourselves to like half of our capability. And when you learn to access that other side of the brain, you learn to get rid of stuff that's holding you back. You learn about your capabilities. You learn what's possible. And it just allows you to be so much more successful. And even in a job where it used to be coming from the outside, in that same exact job, you can get better results because you're doing it in a different way. Yeah. And I love that thought because I I often say sometimes a good proposal manager is jaded. You know, it's it's somebody who has has that been there, done that experience, not my first rodeo, you know, all of those cliches of like, look, I got this, you know, trust me. But then on the backside, there's also like that feeling of I can predict what's going to go wrong. I can predict where this is going to fall off the rails. I can predict that so and so is going to disappoint me. I can predict that my schedule is going to get blown. And it starts putting us in in that defensive state. And, you know, it starts to damage the reputation of a really good proposal manager when they hit that point of, you know, I feel like I can't institute the the change and the discipline and the organizational emphasis on why this job is as important as it is. 
um, you know, sometimes individuals in, in proposals in certain companies, they're coming out of a role that or a job or a responsibility that hasn't necessarily trained them to do this job. They just have an ancillary or a relevant skill set that's applicable. Um, and then there's a lot of pressure put on that individual to succeed by making it up, um, you know, improv along the way. So looking at those two perspectives of somebody who's been in this job for a long time and, and has that been there, done that, and jaded, you can't, you know, there's, you're not going to, nothing's going to surprise me in how wrong this could possibly go. Um, or the individual who's like, I'm not even exactly sure what I should be doing right here. Um, you know, two different sides of that coin. Tell me which one you want to talk about first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about the first one. And, um, you know, we did we did a mindset. I know I've done this before with you. There's a mindset exercise that really shows you how important your mindset is. And I, it's hard to do on a video, but I'm going to kind of go through it if I can. And I'll just take like 30 seconds. But while you're watching this podcast, look around your room and look at everything that's blue and make a list of all the blue things in your mind. Try to come up with eight to 10 or more blue things. And now that you have that done, close your eyes and now list all the red things that are around you. If you take about 10 seconds to try to think, do that. And then go ahead and open your eyes and notice how many red things you couldn't remember, but all the blue things that came to your mind. And it's a really quick exercise, but it really shows us that we find what we're looking for and our mindset really shows us what what we see and our mindset shows us where we're looking. So for that person who's been around the been around a lot, you know, somewhat jaded, who's done this all the time and they're 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 expecting these bad things to happen. They're expecting these schedule delays. They're expecting these things to happen. And I'm not saying they're causing them necessarily, but when you when you're looking for them, you're going to find them. You're going to find maybe not exactly what you're looking for, but something pretty close. And you're going to find a lot of the negatives. And you don't always look for all, all the things that aren't obvious that you haven't looked for before. So you, you, don't, you miss the creative ways to do things. You miss some of the possibilities. You miss some of the opportunities because you're looking at all those things that might go wrong. And if you think of it from a new perspective and start looking for things you don't expect, start looking for the ways that this is going to go well, start looking for the ways this is going to go easier, you actually will find them. It, it'll actually bring new ideas. Um, I know we, we talked about, I talked about positive intelligence and there's a way to kind of train your brain to do things. And, and there's simple like 30 seconds to train that unconscious side of your brain, the, the creative side to, so that you access it because our first side is always to go to that logical side. And if something goes wrong, the first thing we do is we get into, you know, firefighting mode and we try to fix it. Instead, if you kind of, if something goes wrong, if you stop and you just take a couple of minutes and do kind of a, they call it a PQ exercise. And, and one of them that I like is, you know, you just rub your fingertips together for 30 seconds or rub your hands and just feel it and just focus or just take two minutes and listen to all the sounds around you and just listen to the noise. And in doing that, and it, it sounds silly because it's very simple, but it actually opens up your mind so you might see solutions that weren't obvious before. You might see things that you weren't looking for that are new ways to do things that might be even you know easier or quicker or ways to deal with a schedule delay or something. So by doing these type of things, you really will see possibilities you didn't see before. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I, and I testify. Um, one of the things that I started doing is in the morning, you know, I throw my English muffin in the toaster and I go stand on my deck for five minutes and I just let the sunshine hit my face. I have never done that before. And now I do it every single day. I've, I've, I've been doing it all summer long. I don't know what I'm going to do in the wintertime, but I have my vitamin D lamp. So that helps too. But even then, and I do that, I used to do that with my vitamin D lamp of just sit there and just absorb light and taking things down. One of the things that you've taught me, Lori, is take things down to the very basics of just you exist, you know, look around your surroundings, understand, hear the sounds, hear the noises, recognize the colors in your environment. And that to me 
opened up a vision of clarity for all the clutter and junk that goes around in my head every day. I don't start every day worrying about my to-do list. I start every day thinking about what I'm going to accomplish. And those are two different you know, perspectives. And it's very easy to get into the worry about the to-do list as it keeps getting longer and longer and longer. But to stop and appreciate the accomplishments, you know, that dopamine hit that, that comes from checking something off your list, but also the feeling that I've done something good for myself that is going to make someone else's job easier. Or, you know, I've, I've instituted a change that I know will help prevent a schedule slip or something along those lines. But I wasn't going to be able to have that clarity when I had so many thoughts churning in my head of all the things I had to do, had to prevent, had to help somebody else with, had to document so that I could, you know, hold somebody to it. All of those accountability factors that weren't necessarily my responsibility, but I felt as though I had to do them. When I take that step back and I look at, even now as I run my own business, there are certain things that just aren't my concern. And I hand them to my partners. I, you know, this is, this is in your role. This is in your space. And that's one of the things that we try to teach as well is getting the right people to do the right job. So you don't have that sense of obligation for something that's just not your responsibility. Um, so, and I know, I know we didn't talk about the, the other person and the other side of that coin, but I want to springboard off of this a little bit because you got me going and, and help people understand, you know, taking two minutes to pause and let the sunlight hit your face. Like that's, it's just two minutes. What are you going to miss in that time? You know, and those are things that, you know, those of us who are, you know, strapped to our chair every day and working those nine, 10 hour days. It leads to mental exhaustion, absolute mental exhaustion. So as you talk about, you know, that if you see it, if, if you think it, you're going to see it. If you, you know, predict the negativity, you will find the negativity. When we talk about spinning to the positive, I think what I want this audience to hear is that it's okay to do that. <laughs> Um, because these are people, they don't get up. We don't get up from our desks. We answer, we're responsive. Um, I will tell you when I left my career, um, another coach and friend of mine was like, you need to decondition yourself. And, and so let's talk about that. Like sometimes it just feels like I just, I don't have any other choice, but to respond this way. You know, how do you allow that forgiveness in yourself when you, when you take that time back? Yeah, no, that's great. But, and, and that's, that's something we have to recognize in that, you know, self-care, self-love, self-appreciation is so important. And taking the time for yourself to do what you need is so necessary because you can't, until you're coming from your 100%, you can't really give anybody else 100%. So if you're burned out and if you're exhausted and if you're like just going and going and all, you're probably operating at about 70% capacity which means the best you can give to someone else is 70%. You don't have, you're, that 30% is not there. So it really is worth taking the time. I mean, I do a meditation every day. It doesn't have to be long. Some of them are like five minutes. Five minutes, I listen to it on my phone, you know, sometimes even before I get out of bed or the first thing, and, and it just calms me down. Um, there's, the, the, you know, the, the, the PQ, the short 30 second to minute exercises to just stop and do that. The, stop and breathe that that makes you so much more efficient um there's another exercise that it, it's kind of interesting it's called hakalau and this one i don't think i showed this with you it's a focus exercise and it's it's really interesting you take you take your eyes and you look up at the ceiling where um the ceiling and the wall meet and you just focus there for a second and you move your eyes up and down and then while your eyes are up there you take your hands and, and you put them like out to the side and you kind of like use your, go back and forth between the ceiling and your peripheral vision, the ceiling and your peripheral vision. And you do that for about two or three minutes and it increases your focus for like the next 24 hours. I mean, it really wow. does. Like I do that before I have a big talk. Um, I, you know, I train my son to do that before an exam in college or something. Anytime you need to focus that like two minute exercise with your eyes, something about the eyes opens up the brain and helps it focus in your peripheral vision. And I mean, it's an ancient, you know, Indian, Hawaiian thing that they've done, but it, it really helps focus. 
So these little tricks to help you take care of yourself, get yourself in the right mindset, will really make a difference. And you you always have the choice. Nothing is so pressing that it can't wait two minutes. If you've got, if something can't wait two minutes, you've got yourself in that position, you've let it go. <laughs> you know, if you have a proposal due at 6 p.m. and you are working on it at 5.55, you might not be able to spake that two minutes out there, but you need to do something next time. So you're not trying to put that in at 5.55. And so you're putting it in at five o'clock instead of six. So you have that hour to take um, that time. But that, but, you know, taking two minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day, getting up every two hours and going outside, um, taking a, you know, petting a dog, all these things, access the unconscious mind, access the creative part of your brain and help you operate better. They help you perform better. Um, And the other thing you mentioned a little bit about um, celebrating. Celebrating your wins is so important because, you know, our, our wins bring more wins. And the more we celebrate, the more good stuff comes to us. Just like the opposite, if we look for the bad, we see it. If we celebrate our wins, like attract like, and we get more. So you might, even if you're win, every day, when you wake up or the morning or before you go to bed, say, what were my wins today? Your wins could be, you know, you woke up that day. They, that's a win. I woke up today, that's a win. <laughs> Celebrating your gratitude, um, celebrating the things that, you know, the, a person you met that you know, was a good contact. Um, it could be anything from a huge thing, like you wrote a book or you won a big proposal to something simple, like I had a really healthy breakfast. But if you celebrate ev- all these little things, your unconscious mind starts to see happiness and celebration and success And it starts to look for that and it starts to find more and more. Like there's a quote by Oprah that talks about it. I don't know the exact words, but it's like, you know, set your goals as the highest possible, biggest dream possible because you achieve what you believe. You believe you're going to do it. You're going to be able to do it. Your, Your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between reality and fantasy. It can't tell. So it doesn't know if you're, if you really did it or if you just visualized it, it still acts like you did it. And your unconscious mind doesn't, um, doesn't recognize the negative either. So that's another thing, talking positive. Like if I tell you, don't think of a purple elephant. The first thing that pops into your head is a purple elephant. You can't not think of a purple elephant without thinking of a purple elephant. Same way, if you're saying like, oh my God, I don't want to fail. You can't think about failing pops into your head. So when you use negative words, your unconscious mind, your brain sees that failing. You know, if you say, I don't want to fail, all it's seeing is failing, failing, failing. Where if you say, I've succeeded, not only does it see success, but it sees it as already happened. I succeeded. I did this. I won the business. This proposal came in great. This job is amazing. And the more you talk to yourself in those words, you actually get your unconscious mind seeing them and they think it really happened and they react accordingly. So you really can change what happens by thinking of it. And you still need to do the work. You can't just think you're going to win a job and not submit the proposal. That's not going to work. <laughs> but once you submitted the proposal, see the proposal, the job being awarded to you and that'll help. I'll, I'll tease that that's the business developer's mindset. <laughs> But sometimes we need to absorb that optimism. Sometimes we need to regulate it. Um, But I think the, you know, for for this industry in particular, the answer is in the compromise. And it is the doing of the work that gets us there. And um, so let's bring more back to the the other type of person who's found themselves in that position that they're not exactly sure what their responsibilities are. Because there's no, this, there's no degree in proposal management. There's no, you know, capture management. These are, these are skills learned on the job, ancillary to either what you were already doing, or a lot of folks just happen to be in the right place at the right time to be handed an RFP and said, here, go figure this out. So talk about the person who's not feeling sure of themselves. They've not experienced something and they've got that anxiety and, and trepidation for what it is they're about to encounter or where they, they feel maybe 
well, it's not imposter syndrome, right? Because they haven't gotten there yet, but they feel like they don't belong or are suited for the job that they've been asked to do. Right. Yeah. I guess the first thing I would say is everyone feels that they, they're not capable of something. We all have limiting beliefs. We all have limiting decisions. And often they're not true. They're inside of us. And we're limiting ourselves so much more than other people would than, than anybody else does. We limit ourselves. Um, the other thing is we all have what we need or know how to get it. And the, the know how to, if you're, in a, if you're brand new and you're in an uncomfortable thing, knowing how to get it is really impossible. You don't have to do it by yourself. Ask people to help you because if everyone asks for help, if you don't ask for help, you're not, you know, the smartest people in the world ask for help. I mean, the, you know, the most successful athletes have coaches. The most successful executives have a team of coaches and people that help them. So ask for help, ask people for suggestions. And, and the other thing is, um, you know, success and, and risk are related. I mean, if you, if you think of a line and you're in the center here at zero, if you're willing to take this much, you know, if you're willing to take negative three risk, then you're going to get negative three success. If you want to get 10 success, you have to be willing to take 10 risks. And what that means is getting outside your comfort zone, expanding your comfort zone, doing something that you're not 100% sure about. Um, you know, maybe get ask people, do something that creative, trust yourself that you can do it. And then ask yourself, you know, the questions like, okay, people always say, well, what's the worst that could happen? But ask yourself also, what's the best that could happen? Because sometimes you, ha you do have to take a risk and you have to face those fears and, and figure out, okay, I'm afraid I don't know how to do this or I'm afraid I'm going to fail or I'm afraid that I'm in the wrong spot. You have to face it, figure out what to do about it and move past it to go on because you can't get success until you've overcome the fear. And if you let that fear control you, you're really limiting how far you can go and how successful you can be. So you, sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith and trust that, you know, you, your intuition knows the right thing to do. It'll take you to the right person to ask for help. Ask for help, you know, like don't just wing it if you're really not sure. Ask someone for help. If you don't know who to ask to help, you know, try to find someone. Use contacts, use networking, use social media, use whatever you can to ask for suggestions, Um but you have to you have to trust yourself and you have to learn that the fact that you don't trust yourself or that you have these limiting beliefs has absolutely nothing to do with who you are today or where you are today. I think I've mentioned, I know I've told you before that most of our limitations and the, the limits we set on ourselves and our fears and our doubts stem from something that happened when we were between two and seven years old. And it's not something that happened because we had a bad situation or bad family parents or anything like that. It's something that happened that our two to seven year old brain interpreted differently and it stayed with us and it's controlled most of our lives. Most of our fears come from something that happened when we were a child or even prior to that, our body has like generational trauma that we might remember. Our, our body can remember something that happened to our great grandparents and that kind of sticks in our unconscious brain and limits us now. So it, what, what's limiting you probably has nothing to do with your capabilities, your abilities, your performance. It has to do with the fact that your unconscious mind is trying to keep you alive and protecting you. And that's why it doesn't want you to take a risk. So get help and take that risk and, and, and just go for it because you really are. I mean, we all, we're all exactly where we're meant to be. We all have can do, you know, we have everything we need. We're all capable of everything we want to achieve, achieve. And the only thing usually stopping us is ourselves. That's so true. And there's, I, I think that in my experience and the folks that I've had the pleasure and honor of working with along the years in my career, you know, that ability to ask and learn from other people is difficult. Um, and I, I saw a video the other day of, it was somebody um, who was kind of saying, look, look, Learning comes easy to me. I, you know, I'm very adaptable. You can show me a new thing. I'll pick it up in 10 minutes. No big deal. Um, but then it becomes a big deal because then you feel like if it takes me more than 10 minutes to learn something that I failed, 
that, you know, if I have to ask somebody else for that help, then I failed because I've always been so good at solving problems or learning new things or, you know, that adaptability. So how do we take that, that feeling of failure into that feeling of inspiration of, you know, I don't have to be successful 100% of the time. And again, that's something that falls a lot inside of, of, of this career path and in, in, in this industry is we have to be successful as often as possible because that's where the revenue is coming from. <laughs> you know, we don't, we, we fear that taking a risk to lead us to a positive is worse than not taking the risk and negating the negative. Do you do you know what I mean? I feel like yeah. there's a, a difference there. There's yeah, a it's like you're, you're not there. playing to win. You're playing to not fail or exactly. to not lose. And, and, and really in playing to not lose, the only sure thing is that you're not going to win. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's really what you know. If you play to not lose, you're definitely not going to win. And it's, it's, it's really a mindset. It's, it is a mindset shift that there are no failures. You can't fail. You can only learn. And you have to trust that you will get where you want to go. And in trusting that you're going to get where you want to go, that you, you set a goal for yourself and you believe in it and you know you can do it and you trust you're going to get there. But the one thing you have to let go of is how you get there and when exactly you get there and and you you can't you know like someone says i want to be I don't know, just a simple example if i want to be a millionaire and they believe that and they trust it and they're going to be a millionaire yet they can't say how they're going to be a millionaire they can't guarantee i'm going to do this and this and this because that's not how the universe works what they have to do is every step of the way see if, if something happens, they have to look at that and say, okay, this didn't work out the way I thought it would. What can I learn and where can I take it next? And then the next step, the same thing. Okay, this didn't work out the way I planned or the way I thought it would. What can I learn for it and how can it move me forward? And when you keep doing that, you'll get to wherever your goal is. You just have to trust the process and that you're going to get there and not worry about the fact that you're not taking the direct route or you're not taking what you thought because you don't know exactly how the, how things are going to plan. I mean, I, me, I believe in God. I believe in a higher power and I have faith. But there's a there's a meditation I do that's called um, faith over fear. And one of the lines in it is, um, you know, faith is or, or um, prayer is bringing your wishes to God. Faith is leaving them there. You brought them there. You know it's going to happen, but you don't get to decide when or how or the route. You just trust that it's going to happen. And we have to do that with ourselves because you have to believe enough in yourself that I believe I can do whatever I want to do. I believe I can do this and I'm going to set that goal. And if things don't go the way I thought, I don't see it as a failure. I see it as, okay, this is a new opportunity to learn something different, to learn something about myself, to learn something about the situation, to learn how to handle it, and then to do it again and do do something different next time. So if you don't if you don't see, you're never if you don't see failure, you're never failing, you're just learning. And every time you learn, you get a little closer to where you're trying to go and you know a little bit more. And you you ask for help, you you know, and like the one of the things about asking for help, too, is people often feel like they don't like to ask to help for one. Well, they feel like it makes them feel stupid. That's not true. The smartest people in the world ask for help. There's a really interesting YouTube video about Steve Jobs talking about when he was, I think he was about 12 years old and he needed a part for a computer. And he pulled out the phone book and called up um, Mr. Hewlett, the guy who owns Hewlett Packard, and asked if he had any spare parts. And they ended up being friends and he became a mentor. And I mean, that call by that 12 year old chain could have changed the face of the earth. You know, if he had not made that call, who knows what would have happened. Right, you know? right. Um, wow. So smart people do ask for help. And the other thing is, if you help someone, it makes you feel really good. I mean, I love helping people. Helping people is so so much fun, so enjoyable. I would help people, you know, for free. I, I, if I could, I wouldn't charge anybody for any of my services. Um, 
So if you're not asking for help, you're depriving someone from that feeling. Oh, That's there you it. go. <laughs> so you're asking, asking for help. You're giving a gift to the person who at, you asked for because they're getting to give that help. And they felt they, they there's an interesting study about gratitude that they said not only does gratitude make the people who's getting the gratitude feel good, but it makes the person who's giving the gratitude feel even better. So you're really, you know, you're helping people feel good about themselves when you ask them for help. I love that and creating that self-sufficiency in, in that individual as well. And again, that rings uh, so true for for this industry. And as you're as you're saying that, I'm thinking of. Um, you know, anytime we brought on a new salesperson or, you know, somebody that had to use the CRM or had to use SharePoint or had to use some tool that was, you know, common knowledge for most, but tailored enough that you needed to know a little bit about the organization. And this happens all the time with different teammates as you're getting into, you know, different people doing this same job differently. And one of the things that I always used to say to folks was if you, if you spend more than five minutes trying to learn this, you know, tip, trick, how to get into, where to find, call me. I will help you. I will show you through it. But you only get to do that twice. You know, the third time you're going to have to do it on your own because I'm not here to do your job for you. I'm here to help you do a better job. Um, you know, and so having not just the the understanding that you need to ask for the help, but the understanding that you need to take the help and then become, you know, that much better in what you do. And I find that, again, interesting. And some of the, I had a conversation not too long ago with folks who, you know, one person is saying, oh, you know, they, they that person, they just really disappointed me. I was really expecting something more from them in, you know, a, a writing assignment or, you know, an activity, the graphic produ production or something, you know, related to the job. And at the same time, I was like, that person, it's so frustrating. I, I couldn't get through it. I couldn't get around it. And then that person just said, wait, but wait. I'm frustrated because they didn't meet my expectation. Did they even know what my expectation was? And did they actually have the ability to meet my expectation? And so this person who's, you know, senior in this career really said, I had to stop myself from being frustrated. And obviously, it's not that person's fault that I set an expectation for them. I didn't communicate it. So there became the compromise of I'm going to now demonstrate what my expectation is. So how do we talk about that in in those interpersonal relationships where we know and we're thinking I'm going to succeed. I'm going to do a good job. I, you know, I have these capabilities. How do we put that influence out there back into the universe right. for our peers and colleagues? Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. And, and there's something called perception is projection that's I've talked to you about this before, and it's really interesting because it's looking at the way we see the world. We see the world a certain way, and we project that onto other people or onto events or onto things. And those other people are totally unaware of how <laughs> we're projecting our <laughs> our worldview onto them. And they're so, and then when they don't live up to it, they're not living up to our worldview of them, where they're totally unaware of it. What's really interesting is if you look at yourself and, and and you look at your, am I putting my projections on someone else? And you clean that up so you're not doing that anymore. The amazing thing is not only do you suddenly, you're not disappointed, but they actually, the problem often goes away where if you're not putting these pro projections onto them that they don't know about, they actually start doing things that you wanted them to do. Like the problem goes away. So a good way to do things is if you look at somebody or something that you have a negative opinion of, a neg, you know, or somebody you some have maybe a problem with or an issue with, and get a piece of paper and take write two columns, you know, one good and one bad. And on the one column, write down all the positive thoughts, opinions, feelings, emotions, all the positive that you feel about this person. And on the other column, write the negatives, so all the negative thoughts, the negative emotions, the negative behaviors, the negative, all the negative that you feel about this person or the situation. And then look at that list of negative and write, you know, me next to it. And when you look at that list of the negative things you feel about that person, write down all the negative thoughts and behaviors and feelings that that brings up in you. 
So what that makes you feel about yourself, all those negative thoughts that they bring out. And then when you focus on those negative things that that brings out on you and you say, okay, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to let that go. I'm not going to, I'm going to release that. I'm going to release that and just stop putting those negative, th your negative thoughts on that person. The situation cleans itself up and you're not putting your negative thoughts and expectations and feelings on them. And sometimes, you know, it just goes away and the problem's gone and they're living up to your expectation. Other times it frees you to have a good conversation and say, you know, because you, you're not coming at it where you're not coming at them where you're disappointed in them or you're angry anymore. You're now coming at them from, okay, I feel like I was expecting this and you didn't know it. So you can have that conversation. So by doing that and making sure, because it, it, it usually is your projections that you're putting on someone else that's changing your perception of them. And, and, and you never, they're not aware of it. They didn't know about it. And, and, and sometimes they are doing something, you know, sometimes the person you have these negative thoughts is doing something negative. Maybe they right. are being lazy. Maybe they do deserve it. But at least it opens up a way to have the conversation and also to take it off you. So suddenly it is like, okay, this is not my me doing this. So at this point I get to decide, you know, do I, do I let them go? Do I, you know, if they're an employee, do I fire them? Do I put them, if they're, if they're a coworker, do I talk to the boss? But you have to get all your perception out of there first, and then you can do that. That I really appreciate because again, there's, there's different personality types inside of this industry. And I always joke about, you know, the optimism of a business developer versus the pragmatism of a proposal person. And those, again, they either, it's nature versus nurture. They either came that way or they became that way. It doesn't matter. They are that way. Um, and, and having those two sided conversations with polar opposite perspectives about the exact same opportunity that, you know, a business developer can come in and say, I know we're going to win this. This is ours to lose, da, 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 da. And the proposal manager saying, why? You know, what are your proof points? What are what is the information that you have? And the disconnect becomes truly doing the work. And it really becomes I know I know that you think that this is going to be successful, but and, and not to pick on business developers, but to say, but you didn't give me anything to put in my proposal. You know, I can't work off. Hope is not a win theme. You know, we say that all the time or, you know, if everybody just thought they were going to win, not to negate what you're saying, but it's like you do have to do the work. You do have to understand what your responsibilities are. So, again, how do we how do we drive ourselves to get a little bit of that balance between the optimism totally for it and the understanding of our own um, object objectives and the ability to meet the expectation of somebody else. And I'll, I'll give you kind of a scenario, right? So in most proposal activities, we're going to do a red team review. You stop what you're doing in the middle of proposal development. You're hoping that you're 99 or 90, 80 to 90% written. You've got all your concepts down, but you're really looking at, are you compliant to what the government is asking? Are you compelling in that you're telling a great story and you're ghosting your competition and you're justifying your price and you're justifying your salary? You know, all of these things, they're very intense, nuanced things, and they have to be addressed and discussed differently. And then they have to be reviewed by people that not only understand those rules and guidelines that we're trying to follow, but also have this perspective that it's fine because it exists. It's good because I said it. And so how do you balance that as the individual who's who's literally trying to balance the, I get that you think it says that, but it doesn't. And the person who's like, but it does say that. <laughs> you know, how do you draw people back into a little bit more of reality in when you know they're they're they have the optimism, but they don't have the activity? Right. Yeah. And that, you know, the optimism, the 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 positive thoughts, the cleaning up, all of that, what what they what they're they're not saying don't do the work. They're not saying what they're doing is letting you come up with what, what I call, what we call, and what the coach and I learned is inspired actions. So you're, you're basically cleaning up your negative thoughts, releasing the negative beliefs, releasing all the limiting decisions, coming from a positive mindset. You're basically cleaning all the junk out. 
that opens up new possibilities, that opens up your eyes, lets you focus more, that helps develop your relationship with other people because you're, you've are you gotten rid of all the junk that's affecting that. And now what that, what that does is it lets you put together true um, smart goals. And, and there's two, there's the, it's interesting in the smart goals, there's, um, there's the typical smart goals, which is, um, what is it? Specific, measurable, achievable, uh, realistic, and time-based. But then there's also the smart goals, we call them smart goals with a twist, that they're, um, oh, I don't remember all the words, but, you know, they're things like, um, I can't remember them all, unfortunately, but they're a little bit more yeah. like holistic goals and that your smart goals have to be um, sustainable, uh, meaningful. So instead of not just matter, but they yes. need to be meaningful to you. They need to be, um, I forget what the A is, but the R is um, responsible. So they yeah. need to, you know, so they're, they're kind of, you know. There are less little, verbs and more adverbs. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, yes. And when you think of it that way, you actually can see the goal is clean up all the stuff, get your mindset in the right place, let go of all those thoughts and behaviors, live in a place where you're not blaming and shaming, but instead you're you're looking for inspiration. And, and when you do that, you can come up with inspired actions to get to the task. And then you write them down and you put them and you, f- you figure out an actual work plan. And it's a way that, you know, you're using that optimism to come up with new ways or better ways or more efficient ways to do things, including communicate, including, um, you know, figuring out if, if someone's saying this proposal is going to be successful and someone's saying, I don't have enough information, coming together to figure out, okay, what is it that will, will make that proposal successful and how do I get that information? So you're still you're you're doing the work, but you're doing the work in a smarter, cleaner way that you can come up with better ideas and more opportunities and things that you didn't even see before because the collaboration is better and you're looking outside the box. You're looking for more creative ways to do things. So by cleaning up all that other stuff, it just opens up your eyes to new possibilities that you didn't see before. Now, you, like I said, you still have to do the work. You still have to write the proposal. You still have to do the sales. You still have to do that. But you're doing it from a point. The other thing is you're doing it from where you feel like it's success. So the proposal writer feels like, okay, I can do this. The is it development says, okay, we can work together to make this successful. And when you're doing it from that point of view, it tends to go smoother and it tends to be better because you're actually doing it from a place where you are working together to know it will, it'll happen and it'll be better. So, yeah. So it's not even necessarily the, the collaboration, but the camaraderie that comes from that. Right. And, and, yeah. And, and you're working it, at a common goal and that you, you're, you're seeing the other, you know, sometimes a person, if you see the other person's perspective, they do better work just because they're seen. You know, whereas if you feel like you're put, you know, if you're pushing against, if two people are pushing against each other, nothing moves. Whereas if you both start turn a little and push forward, things move. So yeah, I love that. Let's all face the same direction, you know, and 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 that's a lot of it is, you know, we're trained to see the negative, right? We're trained to see the risk in, in the proposal proposal profession. We're trained to find non-compliance. We're trained to look for the negatives. We should also be looking for the positives. We should also be looking for, you know, the win themes and and the strengths and the differentiators and all those things that have to appear in the document to get that product or service sold to the federal government. Um, But to to look at it from the logistics of human interaction is an entirely different perspective for what a proposal process is. And, and the, again, that's another one of the things that's very important to me in this industry and, and what I've been trying to help teach and preach in, in what we do in, in my company is understand these are people working together for a common goal, right? And that common goal is not to win money for your employer, as far as I'm concerned. No. That common goal is to maintain the economy of the United States of America from the federal government's perspective. We keep people employed. We develop these innovations that are that are being brought out into commercial 
purposes. You know, we as human beings are, again, in my personal opinion, one of the pinnacles of the foundation, those are two opposite words, um, we are the pinnacle and the foundation of what is happening inside the federal government on very many occasions. Um, and even down state and local and even in commercial, we are making money move around and we are giving people jobs and we are allowing people to keep their jobs. And I think that that, that human element can get lost in business. And I think you've experienced it. I've experienced it. You know, who makes somebody drive four hours only to terminate them? You know, yeah. who makes somebody, you know, work in the office for 16 hours the day before they're going to get let go? You know, th these things don't make sense from a human to human relationship. So let's just, I think we've got a few minutes left, you know, from your philosophy and uh, talk to me truly about what your coaching perspectives are. What is it that you're trying to do to help those human to human relationships? Right. Okay. So from my coaching perspective, I guess the first thing you need to do is work on yourself. You need to look at what it is that's, you know, do you love yourself? <laughs> Deep down, truly love everything about yourself. And if not, what is it that is holding you back? And you need to release that. And there's ways, you know, in coaching, we have ways we do that. We have exercises. We actually have breakthrough things. I mean, we do every, I even do hypnotherapy at some point or energy releases, timeline therapy. Once you can get release the stuff that's holding you back, you move to a place where you're seeing everything in a, from a place of, a, a place of love, really, where when you see everything from a place of love, you don't see like blame. You don't see like shame. You, you're, you don't see things like, you know, limits. You're actually seeing opportunities and possibilities. And when it helps, and then when you work with other people that way, you actually, when you're happy with yourself, the way you work with everyone else changes because suddenly you're, you're expecting the best out of people. And when you expect the best out of people, you have a tendency to get the best out of people. And people who even, you know, you, you had conflict with, the relationship changes based on where you're coming from. So my coaching philosophy is to first start with you, get yourself, you know, clean up all that stuff in your brain that's limiting you and get yourself to see your own potential. And then once you see your own potential, it's easy to see everyone else's potential and you get better results. Um, so while I'm not focusing on your business, once you clean yourself up, your business gets better. It just happened. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, my clients wanted, you know, she was going through, she was, she worked in real estate. They had properties and they were trying to sell their house and she was just a mess. She was, felt like she was, couldn't do anything. She couldn't get things done. She felt like she was a failure. And we worked on her mindset. We worked on, you know, getting her to let go of stuff, getting her to release stuff. And her relationships came better. And not only that, but her, they sold their house for more money than they, they thought they were going to get. They moved to a new place. And this lawsuit that had been hanging over their real estate business for like four years got settled. I didn't do anything to settle that lawsuit. She didn't do anything to settle that lawsuit. But suddenly the lawsuit got settled because she was coming from a place where she put this out there. This is what they needed to do. And the universe saw it and things just happen. And, and I know, I mean, I'm an engineer, so even... For me, sometimes it's hard to believe it, but I've seen it enough that it truly does happen that way. Um, one of my coaches, Shiraz, he he like makes amazing things happen because he just says I, he expects them. So like he, you know, will get on a plane and he'll be expecting to be upgraded to first class and he gets upgraded for like no reason other than they did it. He just, you know, and, and it really does work that when you get yourself where you're, you're in that place of, you know, we call it effect, but where you're you're in a positive thought, you're open to new possibilities, you're in a loving environment, you're don't you're not blaming or shaming, you're accepting, your your energy level is higher, the vibrations in you, and other people feel that. And it really is, you know, you can actually feel the energy between people. Like just like, you know, if you smile at someone, you make them smile. 
Yeah. And and you feel it through your whole body and, and they feel it. And if the whole world just went around smiling at everything, we'd probably be more efficient. We would follow because people would just be happier. And when they're happier, they get more done. And when they get more done, they're ha- you know, and they pass that on and, and they're, it, it changes everything. So. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a little personal anecdote about that with smiling because um, I have one of those very expressive faces. Um, there's an acronym for when I'm not smiling. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as we're working in in these virtual environments and everybody's on camera, you know, you can have a bad day in the office, right? And you can go sit at your desk and you can ignore everybody. But when, you know, I'm on camera most of the day, you know, talking to clients, talking to our consultants, talking with, you know, great people like Visible Thread. And, you know, I have always, or I have recently, I'm not going to say I've always, but I've come on camera with a smile and I take it from, you know, newscasters do the same thing. Three, two, don't say the one, deep breath, smile. And I've had people comment like, Marsha, you are always smiling. And I'm like, oh, believe me, I am not. (laughs) I'm absolutely not always smiling. But when I'm interacting with another person, I'm going to start out smiling. You know, it's it's up to the rest of the conversation for how that goes. But and and you had something to, this morning, and you had just sent out the um your email about just stop and smile. Yeah, and I share that with my partners, and I was like, you just you have to do that. You have to be like, yesterday was a tough day, today I'm just gonna smile. Yeah, because I know that it's gonna come through in some form or fashion. At the end of the day, I will have something that I can say I did that and I succeeded. Um, and even if it was just, I smiled when I didn't feel like it. <laughs> no, it feels different when you smile. I mean, you, you know, like smile and you just, you can feel it, you, your heart rate slows your body. And when you like, it, it changes the energy in your body. And it's funny, like they talk about how you can't, when you're in a place of gratitude, you can't, if you're, if you're thinking of all the things you're grateful for, you can't get angry. You can't get there. It's, it's impossible to be angry and depressed and, and stressed when you're coming from a place of gratitude. You just can't do them both at the same time. So by just living more in those places, you, better things happen because they suppress all that negative, the negative things. And the negative things don't really serve us in any way, shape or form. I mean, yes, you know, sometimes people get good results by yelling at someone. They get somebody to do someone, but the, the, if they came from a place of love or kindness, the results would be even better and they would be more lasting. So it's hard to, you know, you can get from that tough love, you can get somewhere, but you can get so much higher when you come from that other perspective and you can get better results from other people. You can get people, you know, if, you, if you're if you kind to people and you're loving and you're happy and you're smiling, people will go out of their way to do stuff for you. Whereas if you're not, they'll do what they have to, but they're not going to do extra. <laughs> you know, they're not <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lori, I appreciate this conversation so much. And I know we could talk for hours, but you bring a smile to my face all the time. Um, You know, like I like I said, when we first started, you know, the encouragement that you have always given, this is always, you know, as I've known you, this has always been you, Um, you know, as every time I've had a fear, it's almost like, well, what would Lori do? You know, it's, (laughs) You don't have to be afraid. You can see the positivity. You can see the optim the um the optimistic side of things. It still might not go the way you planned on it going, but is that really wrong in the end? You know, again, bringing it back to the hiss industry, sometimes it truly can be, and it can be quite devastating. Um, you know, the one thing I say that we never need to learn more than once is how to lose, but you know, learning how to prevent, how to promote, how to provoke winning, Um, looking at everything with that winning mindset, with the we're all in this together, we're all going to benefit from this. You know, those are things that we lose sight of. I think in in this industry in particular, um, we're very focused on, you know, what's happening on our screen, what's happening with with the written word, that we forget what's happening with the people that we work with. Um, so I appreciate that you bring these perspectives that, you know, we, we bring everybody together because we do share commonalities, you know, and, and we do look at our industry from a sometimes a, a very shielded view. Um, but to open that up and, and to bring in and embrace 
possibility and change and excitement and love in what we do. Um, you know, remembering that if we can't remember it on a daily basis, hopefully we remember it the next time we submit our next proposal because we've accomplished something and we've accomplished something that is extremely hard to do and very, very hard to succeed at. So I love um, this conversation for for our audience here with the Visible Threat Optimized podcast because it is about optimizing. It is about being the absolute best that we can be, and we need to be that for each other. So thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, you're welcome, Marsha. It's been very, it's been a lot of fun. So, and I depend on all of you since <laughs> I want the government to keep going. <laughs> exactly. So real quick, Lori, beside, before we sign off, how can people get in touch with you if they're interested in hearing more about what you have to offer? Okay, yeah, if you want to learn more about me, um, you can, I have a website. It's called um, reimagine you, the letter U dot net. You can also email me at L McDowell, M-C-D-O-W-E-L-L at reimagine you dot net. Um, if you're interested in my book, it's called The Reinvention Mindset. It's on Amazon and also the reinventionmindset.com. You can order autographed copies or learn more about that. And if you want to have a conversation, um, booklaurie.com will get you to my calendar. I'd love to learn more about any of you or if you're interested in coaching, um, speaking. You know, I'm happy to speak at your events. I do keynotes, training classes for employees, anything like that. Just Email me or book a conversation and I would love to speak with you. That's fantastic. And I will put a plug in for that book. I sat outside. It was another one of my, I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to sit outside and I'm going to read Lori's book. And I would come inside and just be like, all right, let's handle it. Let's do it. Let's go. Um, it, it really does help just, again, with that mindset. It is all about the mindset. And the, the reinvention is what you want to make of it. And, you know, for me, taking what I feel I'm passionate about and being able to share it with other people and having the confidence of being able to do that. I'm so grateful to you, Lori, for that. So thank you again for your time today. And for everyone else, we look forward to seeing you on the next Visible Thread Optimized podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.